Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about Philip Roten's new translation of Haldor Laxness's novel, Salka Valka, which was published just a couple of months ago in 2022 by one of the very best independent publishers there are out there, Archipelago Books. Now, I love Icelandic literature, and Haldor Laxness is not only one of my favorite Icelandic authors, but he's one of my favorite authors of all time. And so when I learned that Philip Roten, one of my favorite translators from Icelandic, was tackling this pretty big novel, I was very excited to finally pick it up. Before I get to Salka Valka, though, I do think it's worth starting with a bit of background on laxness and Iceland itself, as it seems necessary when dealing with literature from such a small country. But feel free to skip ahead, timestamps are down below. In Icelandic literature, there are two bodies of work that modern Icelandic authors and readers can't quite escape. There are more, of course. I mean, the poetry of Hallgrima Pietursen and Jonas Hallgrimsen uh, are two other monoliths of Icelandic literature, but bear with me. The first is the massive body of medieval Icelandic sagas, which I will not put on my shelves because I fear that it'll break. And these are one of the gems of world literature, in my opinion. And the second is the massive bibliography of the modernist Haldor Laxness. Laxness is the only Icelander to win the Nobel Prize in Literature, which he won in 1955, and he is still revered as one of the most important Icelanders of the 20th century. One of the reasons why he is so important is because during the early parts of his career, at least, he was writing at a time when the Icelandic independence movement was reaching its peak and finally achieving its goal. I won't go through the whole history of Iceland for obvious reasons, though if you want a good book recommendation on the history of Iceland, uh, Gunnar Karlsson's uh, History of Iceland is quite good. But Iceland was a colony of Norway and then the Kalmar Union and then Denmark for pretty much 800 years. And there was an independence movement, beginning really in earnest in the 18th century and then picking up a lot of steam in the mid 19th century, but really all coming together in the early parts of the 20th century. There was a movement towards Icelandic nationalism as Icelanders wanted to get out of the thumb of, get out from under the thumb of Denmark's colonial rule, which by this point, Denmark had control over Iceland for hundreds of years. Obviously, this movement extends far beyond laxness and includes people in such various fields as academics who were interested in the Icelandic sagas to politicians, poets, etc. This was a big movement that in the 1930s and 40s especially was all coming together and was finally successful in 1944 when Iceland officially gained its independence from Denmark. And in this period, the late 20s, throughout the 30s and the 40s, is when, is when Laxness was really becoming quite famous for his literature, as he was writing about Iceland and Icelandic people as independent people. This may sound obvious, but for Laxness, Iceland wasn't just a remote colony of Denmark. It was its own entity, filled with its own culture, people, and language. Haldor Laxness was a prolific poet and novelist from a very young age. He published his first novel when he was 16, which includes the, a, a line that is included in this biography um, called The Islander by Haldor Guthmanson, which is also translated by Philip Roten, by the way. Um, this amazing line that I just adore coming from a 16-year-old, which is, dead is all without dreams, and sad the world. Laxness was also a public intellectual. He traveled to Europe and to America. He, tr he translated authors like Ernest Hemingway into Icelandic. He wrote for leftist newspapers, etc. He's an incredibly important figure to 20th century Iceland, as his life spanned the entire century minus like four years. And he remains one of, if not the cornerstone of modern Icelandic literature. Salka Valka is one of his earliest books. It was published in two volumes in 1931 and 1932, when he was just around 29 years old. While he does experiment later on in life with different genres with novels like Under the Glacier and The Atom Station, Haldor Laxness is most known, I think, for his socialist Freudian slip there, is social realist novels. Brad Leithauser, writing a review of Salka Valka for the Wall Street Journal, writes, Laxness is the most Bruegelesque of novelists. His villagers, like Bruegel's peasants, are viewed unsparingly. A cool northern luminosity lays bare their infirmities and deformities, their pockmarked faces, missing limbs, toothless mouths, blinded eyes, 
theirs is often a cheerful and obliging grotesquerie. Comparing laxness to Bruegel is fascinating for so many different reasons, but the reason I like it so much here is that both Bruegel and laxness focus so heavily on the ordinary, on the mundane in the literal sense of that word, on these peasants and villagers just eking out an existence, and all of their blemishes are laid bare for the viewer to witness. And importantly, both artists do so with such empathy, and they raise the ordinary village and the ordinary individual to such high heights. For Laxness, this isn't just an artistic choice, but a political choice as well. Laxness was a devout socialist, and while I'm not suggesting that his novels are simply political novels, there is a reason why Laxness continually, throughout his career, chose to center his works on wholly ordinary, working class people again and again, and raise their loneliness, their poverty, their friendship, and their kindness to such high heights. He raises his ordinary characters to the same heights as the Germanic heroes that the Icelandic sagas are often interested in. Heroism for Laxness's time isn't a man holding a bloody sword aloft, but a union leader fighting for the rights of their exploited workers. And side note, this isn't necessarily a revision of the saga's worldview. I mean, the sagas are mainly about very ordinary farmers. I mean, one of the famous saga protagonists um, is Njal Thorgesim in Njal Saga, and he is a lawyer who never touches a sword in the entire saga. But that's a whole new video. Back to Laxness, whose socialist sensibilities aren't the only aspect of himself that are in fundamental to his novels, but they're always there. His novels focus on ordinary working class people and the difficulties that they face living in a exploitative, capitalistic, and colonial state. And I think he does this exceptionally well in Salka Valka. Salka Valka is about the life of a woman named Salver Valgether, who goes by Salka Valka, which is much easier on my tongue. And if you know Icelandic naming customs, you know right off the bat that her name doesn't include a patronymic, and that is because she doesn't have a father. She's illegitimate. At this book's opening, Salka Valka is living with her mother, Sigurlina Jonsdottir, and they are trying to attain some sort of security. To achieve this, they try moving, and they can't get to their final destination because they run out of money, and they end up in this small village called Osari in Aklafjöthur, where they are, of course, complete outsiders, and they're treated as such. The very religious residents of the town treat them terribly because Sigurlina had Salka out of wedlock. And the rest of the novel takes place in this small village, and this village becomes the, the world, as Laxness always does. He's able to take these small villages and make them become a microcosmic stage for the entire world. And life in Osari is difficult. There are no social safety nets. And the entire village depends upon the yields of the fishermen and the merchants, the Danish merchants, who control the entire economy. This is an economic ecosystem where a single bad summer can lead to a famine for years. Salka at one point quips, Liefeth er saltfisker, life is salted fish, which is a quote I'll come back to in just a little bit. But the reason I quote it in Icelandic is because it has since become a kind of Icelandic proverb, an encapsulation of what life was like in Iceland in the first half of the 20th century, but also the 1100 years of history before that. Again, this is a social realist novel, and so the very basic living conditions, the mundane struggles, are at the center of this novel. The first half of this book follows Salka's childhood, as they, again, are trying to eke out an existence. They work at the Salvation Army. Um, Sigurlina, Salka's mother, falls in love with this man, or falls for this man named Steinthor, and Steinthor and Salka don't get along at all, and they continually fight. And Steinthor is a terrible person who treats both Sigurlina and Salka terribly. He very much embodies the kind of patriarchy which controlled these women's life, and I won't go into too many more details here, but I think you can see where this part of this story is going. But so much of this book is really a Bildungsroman of Salka, this young woman whose, quote, whole body roiled with unruly vitality, as she's described as a child at the beginning of this book, which is just great. As she grows up, she fights against all of these systems, mainly made up of men who try to dominate her politically, socially, and sexually. And so while much of this novel is very much about the personal development of Salka, who again is just this incredibly well-wrought character, it's much more a Bildungsroman of her political, 
and social awakening. As Salka works through and tries to figure out which political ideologies she wants to abide by and develop on. That is, while this novel is very clearly about Salka Valka, the title suggests that, it is in a lot of ways a Bildungsroman of Iceland as a nation, as they fight their colonial oppressors and try to figure out which direction they want to go in. And so much of this book is really these political arguments between these villagers as they try to figure out which political philosophies they want to adopt capitalism, socialism, communism, and they try to figure out if they want to continue to submit to the Danish merchants whom they owe a great deal to, their jobs and all of their foreign goods that get brought into their little town, or if they want to break from their shackles and create something new. There's a Danish merchant in this novel named Johan Boyesen who really has a market monopoly in the town and whom the townspeople are completely split on. Some want to continue to support him, as again, their jobs depend on it, and others want to break away from him, as they recognize that he's, well, exploiting their labor. And although the villagers toiled incessantly, in competition with the whims of the weather, the fruits of their labor were nowhere to be seen. Everything disappeared down the same hole, whether people fished for a share of the catch or a fixed wage. Their accounts with Johann Boyesen swallowed everything. Here, no one ever saw money. In the first half of the 20th century in Iceland, the most powerful figure is the merchant, the Danish merchant mind. And this is, of course, a hefty part of the subject matter of independent people, Halder Laxness's most famous work. But we get a lot of it here in Salka Valka. As I noted earlier, Laxness was a devout socialist, and as a young man, he traveled to America and spent a lot of time in Hollywood, where he met authors like Upton Sinclair and many others, and he began exploring all of these different political theories in his 20s, coincidentally in the 1920s, which is the decade leading up to him writing this novel. And this socialism is really at the core of Salka Valka, as again, we get all of these debates at the co-op between workers, and Salka talks to all different characters from all different parts of this political spectrum. And all of these characters have different ideas about labor and capital, about whether they should create a union or not. There's a really strong tension and outright debate throughout this book um, between Marxism and capitalism. One of my favorite moments is pretty early on when Salka is talking to this old man named Eyjolfur, who gives this brilliant speech to Salka. Working is beautiful and necessary because it gives the heart peace and contentment and usually provides you what you need to keep from starving and freezing. And if you work nonstop all your life, day in and day out, you may be able to pay for your own funeral when you die. But believe me, good child, no one becomes rich by working. The few rich people I that I saw in my life never worked a day, while the greatest poverty always plagued those who toiled hardest, and I expect it's the same in other villages. But the knowledge and pleasure that you can get from a good book are better than wealth, which is why, if I were in your shoes, I would put more effort into reading and writing. Worst for them is to realize that you have an education." It's so good, but the first half of that speech really reminds me of this brilliant line that's always stuck with me from independent people, that the life of a man is so short that ordinary people simply can't even afford to be born. While Laxus is unreservedly a socialist, what I think he does exceptionally well in Salka Valka is really pick apart these political and economic ideologies. And while we get passages like the one that I just read, this book never really comes across as overly dogmatic or moralizing, as he allows all these different characters to voice all of their different opinions, and Salka argues with them all. He, she argues with the capitalists as aggressively as she argues with the Marxists. And I think what we see here is Laxness himself genuinely and honestly working through all of these different political models. He exposes almost every single political ideology to be, necessarily, rather idiosyncratic when professed by individuals. Laxness's own socialism is pretty idiosyncratic, as far as I can tell. And so parts of Salka Valka really feel like this rhetorical game, as our characters sort of do the Socratic method as they put these political ideologies and these political models up against each other and question their way through each of them. And so I think if this book has any glaring faults, it's that in these moments the fictionality of this text does fall apart a bit, as these debates can go on for pages and pages and pages. That is, in many ways, this is a novel of ideas, where our characters embody certain ideas and then are pitted against each other. And of course, their real-world counterparts wouldn't have been far from the mind of Laxness's contemporary readers, which got Laxness in quite a bit of trouble. With all that said, though, these debates are clearly a fundamental part of this novel, as this novel is as much a Bildungsroman of 
Salka Valka as it is for Laxness himself. Again, he's relatively young when writing this. He's writing this novel in his late 20s, when, when he just came back from this extended trip to America, where he stayed in Hollywood and met all of these different people, and now is coming back to Iceland with all of these new ideas. And he's coming back to these small villages. I mean, Reykjavik at this time had way less than 100,000 people. And he's really genuinely, I think, trying to figure out which political philosophies Iceland should adopt moving forward. And while Laxness was undoubtedly a socialist, Salka Valka really shows that he was under no illusion that socialism came with no faults. There's no utopia here. This novel, for all of its seriousness, is filled with parody and satire as these political philosophies get embodied, caricatured, bastardized, broken down, rebuilt, etc, etc. The politics of Salka Valka lean leftist, obviously, but this novel goes out of its way to not be moralizing. Salka herself refuses to be seduced by any single political theory. And alongside all of these politics, there is this deep look at faith and Christianity in Salka Valka. Laxness was very Catholic, at least very early in life, though his faith in Catholicism seems to be wavering a bit, even by the time he's writing Salka Valka, as his faith in secular socialism is on the rise. If you look at Haldor Laxness's life, he really goes through phases of which kind of belief system he's very devoted to. It begins with Catholicism, moves into socialism, and sort of goes into uh, Taoism later in life. Most of the townspeople in Osari are religious, but there is this increasing tension between all of these new ideas that are coming in with Marxism and socialism and all this different stuff with these old and traditional uh, worldviews. There is this constant tension between the old and traditional and the new and modern. While there isn't in this novel a rejection of Christian faith, again, Laxness was uh, a Catholic, there seems to be, at least to me, the very beginnings of this existentialist philosophy coming in here. As our characters, especially Salka herself, begin questioning their own faith and the relationship between their belief in this god and their very difficult lives. There never seemed to be good weather in this village because the creator was always experimenting with his sky. After frost and snow, he brought winds, which whipped in the snow into drifts. After whipping the snow into drifts, he would send a thaw and melt all the drifts that he had swept together with great effort. All in all, it might be said that the creator's favorite weather for this village was rain, which stirred up all sorts of stenches, sea and seaweed, fish, fish heads and fish guts, train oil, tar, manure, and refuse. And down from the mountain flowed at least 50 streams which he directed through the village's vegetable patches, at whose corners the water pooled and spilled in little cascades over the low garden walls. And this description goes on and on, and it ends with the line, the creator could go on like this uninterrupted, as if purely for his own amusement. Laxness always infuses his naturalistic descriptions with his major themes, and they're one of my favorite parts of Laxness's books, it's his descriptions of the natural world. When asked about her own faith in God, Salka responds, I suppose there's no other God but fish. Salka is a realist who from the start has been disadvantaged. She has no father, no formal education. She's taken as a part of the weaker sex by the villagers. And further, she lives in a world where workers are exploited, and so faith doesn't really offer too much security for her. There's a great moment early on in this novel where she's working at this store, and she sneaks into the back office. And in there, on top of the desk, is this really big book which controls every everyone's life. And Salka thinks that this book looks like the Bible, and takes it as such, but of course, it's not a Bible, it's the store's ledgers, which records each villager's store credit. Capitalism and Christianity being fused together is, well, it's not really new, I guess. While Salka is a dreamer in a lot of ways, the amount of times that this novel says something like Salka dreamed is really quite high. She is, at the end of the day, a realist, concerned with her own material existence. She's a survivor, a woman who needs to be more concerned with how she's going to obtain her next meal rather than being concerned with abstract political theories, which, as much as she's interested in them, they don't pay the bills. She goes through a lot in this book, as does her mother, and she doesn't waste any time on frivolous things, and she gets quite mad at a few different moments at people's incessant politicking at their long-winded debates because what she really just wants is a life of security, a simple life of security. While arguing with a man named Arnaldur who has been away to the continent and has brought back all of these, these glorious ideas about communism, she scolds him in this very famous passage that I alluded to earlier. Arnaldur, 
may I just ask you one thing, even though I haven't seen you since I was little and you told me stories about visions and dreams. Is it still your view even today that we ordinary people here in this village should live on castles in the air? I will not deny that many things here in the village could be better, but when all is said and done, life is salted fish beyond all else and not pipe dreams. And if the company can no longer buy or process fish due to wage hikes, we won't be able to get rid of our fish. And what will happen then? Salka, in the end, doesn't care about political theory. She doesn't care about political parties or ideologies. What she does care about is surviving as an independent person. Though she does, unlike, say, Bjartor of Summerhouse's in Independent People, she does actually care about her community, and she really wants to be a voice for the people. And just a few pages later, when talking to Arnoldur again, she, uh, well, yells at him for his staunch communism. This is Salka speaking first. You're just a doctrine, and a false doctrine at that. When did you ever harbor human feelings for a single soul? Heaven save me from that, he said. At that moment, I would be lost. I am inseparable from the masses. I am like the birds, the girl. Then I think you should go down to the shore and shriek with the terns. <laughs> Laxus's socialism didn't blind him to the over-idealization or the human infallibility inherent in these political movements. And I need to reiterate how great of a guide we have through all of these different conversations, as Salka is a fiercely independent woman with who isn't afraid to give her own opinions. She's highly independent, but fights for her fellow workers. And she breaks just about every gender norm there is out there. She refuses to wear dresses and wears pants instead, which creates quite a scandal. When told by another character that young girls ought to be respectable, otherwise they may develop a bad reputation, she responds, I'm certainly no woman and never will be. I don't care what anyone says. Salka Valka, the character, is simply awesome. She's really well written, and while I was reading this book again and again, I was just so surprised that this was written by a, a man in the first half of the 20th century, as this novel is extremely feminist, and while it's interested in the larger socio-political conversations of its time, it's very intersectional and very sympathetic to the specific plight of women during this period. And it has some pretty wild passages that help Laxus get this point across, my, my favorite being this moment where this this woman starts arguing that Jesus Christ didn't know real suffering because he was never a mother. And she asks, what is it for a person with no children to hang on a cross for one day? And she goes on to compare his suffering with what she has gone through with having a house full of starving children in winter. And she's left asking, what is his suffering compared to mine? I mean, heretical or not, I think that's a pretty profound question. Salka Valka is, I think, one of Laxus's better novels. And while I often do get bored with social realism, and this book is no exception, by the way, there are moments that I, I did slog through as the fishermen were having their fourth debate at the co-op about whether they should form a union or not. With all of that said, Laxus's prose is never boring. Unlike many of the American social realist novel, uh, novelists of Laxus's time period, whom I do like, but I never really actually enjoy reading their books, Laxness's prose poetry is always striking and it's always uh, unique and invigorating. Even when the characters are talking about how corporations exploit labor or something, you know, a point that we've all heard a thousand times, he does it in a, a new way. His writing makes it feel new. If you're interested in reading Laxness, I don't think this is a bad place to start. I mean, this is actually, I believe, the first of Laxness's books to be translated into English in the 1930s. Though, of course, this is a new translation by Philip Roten. So it would be a pretty interesting place to start, if nothing else. I might recommend The Fish Can Sing or even Iceland's Bell, though, as these novels are a bit more contained. But if you do want to start with one of Laxness's more epic in scope novels, I think Salka Valka is right up there with independent people. And again, I think Salka Valka is perhaps my new favorite Laxness character. And last thoughts, I think Salka Valka is a really good example of how a novel can be both political and art. I know there are a ton of readers who think that the former will always negatively affect the latter as it'll make the art dogmatic or moralizing or something, and so we need to keep politics out of art, whatever the hell that means. But I think 
what Salkavalka really shows is that in the hands of a great artist and a deep political thinker, how a novel can do both effectively while still getting at the heart of, well, of the human heart. Laxness, as it, he shows in Salkavalka, is always political, but he's never divorced from the human spirit. Anyways, thanks for watching.